Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Caroline Griffin. I am Riot's Event and Operations Manager. I am super excited to have you here today as um, well as Aparna and Corey. Um, so just a couple of things before we get started. This will be recorded, so if you need to leave early, no worries. Um, no need to take furious notes. Uh, this will be made available on Riot's YouTube channel and then shared through Riot's meetup pages. If you do have any questions, I encourage you to please put those in the chat box and Aparna has um, graciously agreed to make sure that all of your questions get answered. Um, without further ado, I know you are here to see the Lunch and Learn um, with Corey Stone, so um, I will give it away to Aparna. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Caroline, appreciate it. And thank you attendees for attending this Lunch and Learn, virtual Lunch and Learn entitled, Not All Crystals Are the Same. We are the Aurora Group. We'll be presenting with Corey on Tai Chi and Platronics, Frequency Devices and Crystals. Uh, a few words about the Aurora Group before we get going. We are located in the Southeast. We're covering several areas in the Southeast. We've been around for a little over 30 years and we have a lot of experience in electronic components mechanical components, contract manufacturing, and test services. Our office is in Raleigh. This kind of gives a brief history of where we came from and which firms were acquired to produce the Aurora Group. Basically, we are engineers and technical folks that want to help solve technical challenges and look for the best solution to help OEMs and engineers. Here's a snapshot of our group and the full backgrounds. We got Bob, myself, and Ken in the Carolinas. Kathy is in our inside sales. Bob Ball also in the Carolinas. Bob Kirkland covers South Carolina, Karen in Georgia, and Bruce covering Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi. We're here to help on any of your technical questions. This is basically the coverage of the Southeast and the East Coast that we support. What we do, we'll follow up a lot on customer questions, orders, samples, work on behalf of OEMs, bridge a lot of the customer and manufacturer communications regarding delivery and new designs. We really try hard to work on new designs and create the best solutions to fulfill customer needs. We have other manufacturers that we support as well, along with Platronics and Tai Chin. And we are connected everywhere from of course the riot to launch bio, ERA, and every association connected with our types of components. And of course, we work with all the distributor partners. If you're looking for a solution, we should be able to help you with magnetics, mechanical components, capacitors, testing, frequency control devices, displays, connectors, motors, thermal solutions, and more. The main event will be presented by Corey Stone. Corey has been with Tai Chen Plytronics for over 25 years and worked with all kinds of different components in different companies. He will be talking today about crystals, oscillators, VCXO, TCXOs, OCXOs, and precision crystals. Right now, I'd like to turn it over to Corey to continue on with the presentations and tell us why all crystals are not the same. There you go. Uh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, one clarification, um, I've been in the industry for over 25 years. Um, I've been with Tai Chi and Platronics going on a year, a little less than a year now. Um, and uh, I think, um, uh, you know, what we'll do is we'll go over a quick introduction to Tai Chi and Platronics. We'll talk a little bit about uh, crystal basics so we uh, get up to speed on the discussion today. We'll talk about how uh, the impact of miniaturization on crystals. And then we'll talk about how we can avoid the impact of miniaturization and how we can mitigate what happens with that. 
like uh, Aparna said, please ask questions as you go through. This is, you know, really for you guys. Um, and so, you know, please uh, take advantage of that. I think Tai Chan and Platronics are the best kept secret in North America. And tai Chan has been around for over 45 years. Our headquarters are in Taiwan. We have manufacturing locations throughout the um, uh, Taiwan and China. I think that's a differentiator for us that we are actually a manufacturer. We have advanced development and R&D at our headquarters in Taiwan. And Tai Chan supports the high volume production uh, requirements of our customers. Platronics has been around for almost that long, more than 40 years. We've been part of Tai Chen for almost two years. Platronics is located just outside of Seattle in Linwood, Washington. And so we're in North America. We have basically local real-time engineering support for our customers. We focus on fast delivery, smaller lot sizes, more customer requirements at Platronics. And so together, Tai Chan and Platronics are actually number 10, perhaps number nine in terms of uh, worldwide size. Um, we have a complete product capability. We can supply your raw quartz all the way through the high-end OCXOs, and we have complete production capability from, from prototype, small volume prototypes all the way through high volume production. So you know, Tai Chan and Platronics, you know, are really positioned to support all your requirements from a frequency control or a timing standpoint. When I started thinking about this presentation, you know, and, the, you know, one of the first things I think about whenever I think about IoT is that miniaturization is inevitable. We're, you know, we're all going to try and get smaller. We're all going to try and fit into, into other, um, uh, the, the small spaces and, and get utilized wherever we can. You know, the other realization that I think we have is that all our IoT devices need a crystal or a clock. We're doing something with RF in terms of a protocol or some telemetry that we're going to be transmitting. Um, we're we're going to be uh, recording events or, or doing something with timing in that regard. So all our I, IoT devices need a crystal or a clock. And in that regard, when we put those two things together, uh, miniaturization affects our performance and timing's no, no different. Uh, uh, the crystal performance will change um, as we change the size of the crystal um, and actually can get a little bit more difficult to use as we go down in size. So a simple solution might be to use an oscillator. Oscillators are easy to use. They're a black box. You just add power and they work. Um, we have oscillators that cover the frequency ranges that our crystals do, and we have oscillators that are as small as our crystals. So in that regard, uh, you know, an oscillator could be a reasonable solution for your, your application. The issue might become that the oscillator will probably add power. Uh, which can be a problem for us because a lot of IoT applications are, might be battery operated. And they can also add a little bit of cost. Uh, the oscillator is more expensive than our crystals are. And, and most of our ICs have an oscillator circuit inside them. And so, you know, the oscillator, you know, would be a cost adder. So it turns out that crystals are a necessary solution for us. And, and the crystals can be just as reliable as our oscillators. We just need to understand how to pick the right crystal, the right size for the job we have at hand. There are a lot of crystals out there. And generally, when people think of crystals, the first one they think of is the 32.768 uh, real-time crystal, or what's referred to as the watch crystal. That's not what we're going to be talking about here. We're going to be talking about your transmit crystal or your RF crystals, what we refer to as megahertz crystals. And these crystals are AT cut quartz crystals. And um, the AT cut crystal is a thickness shear mode of vibration, which means as if we look at a quartz wafer, and this is our diagram of a quartz crystal with our quartz wafer here and our two electrodes, and we have it epoxied inside the package and we have a lid on that package. You know, if we look at that crystal from the side, we'd see two plates moving back and forth uh, uh, along each other. And so there is actually physical movement inside the crystal. A 26 megahertz crystal actually has two plates moving back and forth together in the center of the crystal 26 million times per second. This is a finite element analysis of a crystal. And we can see uh, that the green area shows where there is no movement. The red area shows where the active area of the crystal is. And, and you know, we'd like to keep that activity in the center of the crystal. One of the things about the AT cut crystal is the uh, frequency actually is determined by the thickness of the crystal. If we take the thickness of the, if we take the frequency of the crystal divided into 66, 
that gives us the thickness of the crystal in thousands of an inch. And so a 26 megahertz crystal is about 2.5 mils thick. The average sheet of paper is about four mils thick. So, you know, we're taking quartz, the second hardest material known to man, and turning it into a, a thin sliver, thinner than a sheet of paper, and then trying to get that to oscillate millions of times per second. As I said, the ideal thing would be that we keep the active area of the crystal in the center so that none of that vibration or none of that physical movement is able to make it to the outside edge. When the package gets smaller, that's almost what we do. The thickness of the crystal will remain the same because our frequency hasn't changed and that's the thickness of the crystal is what drives our frequency, but everything else will get smaller. The width of the blank or the quartz wafer will get smaller. The size of the electrodes that we put on the crystal will get smaller. All this makes it harder for us to put energy into the crystal and it makes it harder for the crystal to start and sustain oscillation and it's these changes or the equivalent circuit of the crystal that we and and the changes to that that we need to be aware of this is a look at the equivalent circuit of a quartz crystal it's more than just a capacitor in a sense the symbol for a uh, quartz crystal uh, uh, looks a lot like a capacitor and um, but unfortunately it's a little bit more complex than that you can see that we have lc's and r's as we look at the quartz crystal electrically, there's two parts of it. There's a motional part to the crystal and there's a static part to the crystal or basically uh, uh, what the crystal looks like when it's oscillating versus what it looks like whenever it's in a, uh, like I said, a static condition. We're really making a capacitor where quartz is our dielectric separating two electrodes. And so if we look at quartz in a static condition, it really looks like a capacitor to us. And that's the shunt capacity that we see here, the C sub O. When we're able to, when we apply energy to the crystal and the crystal achieves oscillation, we see emotional side of the crystal. And here we get uh, emotional capacitance, we get emotional inductance, and we get a real resistance referred to as the ESR, sometimes called R1. And these are on the motional arm of the crystal. The in, impedance of the capacitance and the inductors will balance out. So in operation, we'll really be left with the resistance of the crystal in our circuit and something that we'll need to wrestle with. So as package size goes down, we're able to maintain the frequency and stability of the crystal, but the equivalent circuit, these LCs and Rs, change and these changes will impact our circuit performance and will impact our circuit reliability. This chart here simply shows us uh, the, the surface mount packages that are available for crystals today, um, ranging in size from the seven by five millimeter package all the way down to the 1.6 by 1.2 millimeter package. You can, a couple of things to notice is the bigger the package, the wider the frequency range. And that's because big packages let us use big crystals and big crystals, you know, um, tend to oscillate relatively slow. As we go down in size, you'll see the frequency range comes up. And that's, again, because the slower it goes, the bigger it is, the faster it goes, the smaller it is. But all of these packages support 26 megahertz, just not the same way. This gives us a look at the equivalent circuit parameters of the crystal and the way they change relative to package size. This is a, a 26 megahertz crystal. And if we're in the seven by five millimeter package, you can see the resistance of the crystal is relatively small. But as we go into the smaller 1.6 by 1.2 millimeter package, the resistance of the crystal tends to go up on us. Conversely, the capacitances tend to go down as we go down in package size. And that's because our electrodes are getting smaller, our, our dielectrics are getting smaller and the capacitances we're able to produce are, are you know, reduced as a result of that. And you know, the motional inductance tends to increase um, as we go down in package size. And some of that's to offset the changes in capacitance we see, but some of that's also driven simply by the physical properties of the, of the quartz. And, and we'll see how all of these impact our circuit operation coming up. This gives us a look at equivalent series resistance or R1 versus package size. Again, a smaller wafer means smaller, uh, uh, a smaller size means a smaller wafer. Uh, means a smaller electrode. And you can see that in our seven by five millimeter package, the largest one, the equivalent series resistance of the crystal is the lowest. Uh, 
in our smallest package, the 1.6 by 1.2 millimeter package, the ESR of the crystal is, um, is the highest. And so, you know, as long as we're aware of how that ESR changes with package size, then we can take the appropriate steps in our circuit design to accommodate this change in, in ESR. But, you know, the higher ESR does mean reduced design margin. And that's something that we want to remember as we select our crystals. Corey, we have a question here. Mm -hmm. What is the parameters to keep the oscillation increasing beyond its normal properties? What is, could you repeat that question to me again? It's in the chat box. It also okay. came let me get the Let me get the chat box. What is the param parameters to keep the oscillation increasing beyond its normal properties? Or what are the parameters? Uh, hang on just a second here. I'm trying to get the zoom window back up. So um, the primary frequency determining parameter of the crystal is its thickness. And you know, as we manufacture the crystal, basically we're, we're reducing the thickness of the crystal. And so as we go through the manufacturing operation and make the crystal thinner and thinner, it will go up in, si it will go up in frequency, but ultimately we'll stop that processing. And, and so the, um, you know, the crystal frequency will be stable because the thickness of the crystal will be stable. To really, you know, um, we can get crystals to oscillate on other modes. You know, we've been talking primarily about the fundamental mode of the crystal. We can get the crystal to oscillate on odd overtone modes, and that might be a way we can get the crystal to oscillate higher in frequency. Um, and, and that would be done by, you know, trapping out the fundamental mode and making it easier for the other modes to, to come into play. I don't know if I answered the question. It was a little bit... Uh, yeah, I, I, the question wasn't entirely clear to me. So perhaps if you can restate that question in a different manner, I can answer it better for you. So I apologize for that. They're, they're referencing uh, keep it from increasing. So maybe that might help add a little bit more to it to keep it from increasing. Well, to keep it from increasing, we just uh, uh, we, um, we 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 simply control the thickness, right? Uh, so to keep the frequency from increasing, we stop reducing the thickness of the crystal. So again, I'm not sure if that if that, that answers the question. It's size dependent. It is size dependent. That is correct. the 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 thicker it is, the slower it goes. The thinner it is, the faster it goes. And we simply, and, and everything we do affects the frequency of the crystal. So, you know, initially we're cutting the quartz or cutting the quartz wafer from the bar quartz and it's gonna have a, a particular thickness to it. Then we're gonna um, manipulate the surface of the crystal to get it to the appropriate uh, uh, surface finish that we need for good operation. We're gonna thin the crystal down to the, uh, so it's operating at the appropriate frequency. But then we're also going to be adding electrodes to the crystal and the electrodes, you know, tend to work the other way. Whereas we reduce the thickness of the crystal, we increase the frequency. When we add electrodes to the crystal, we actually um, lower the frequency of the crystal. And so, you know, again, it's really the frequency is thickness driven by controlling the thickness of the crystal or the um, mass of the crystal, we're able to control the crystal's frequency. Good. Well, I appreciate the question. Thank you, Corey. Proceed. Yep, uh, like I said. Uh, so here's a look at uh, motional capacitance versus package size. Um, and the reason why motional capacitance is important to us is because the motional capacity of the crystal helps determine the um, uh, impact of the electrical circuit to the crystal. A smaller size means a smaller electrode, a smaller electrode means a smaller C1, and a smaller C1 or a smaller motional capacitance means a decreased circuit effect or a decreased poolability. The chart that we're looking at here shows three package sizes are 3.2 by 2.5 down to our 1.6 by 1.2 and shows the frequency variation relative to picofarads worth of change. So if I take a 10 picofarad crystal and apply 12 picofarads, you can see the frequency is going to change somewhat and that will change about uh, 25 part per million per picofarad or maybe about 50 parts per million. In the smaller package, because I have a smaller C1, it's less sensitive to those types of changes. And if I take that uh, 10 puff crystal and apply 12 picofarads to it, I'm only gonna get 
um, 10 or 20 parts per million worth of frequency change. So it shows that the smaller packages are less sensitive to circuit changes. And, you know, so that can mean it's harder for us to set on frequency as the size goes down. Um, you know, and certainly something that we'll want to make sure that we, again, keep into account that our crystal is matched for our circuit, particularly if we're using a small size. Oops. Hang on just a second. Seem to be having a technical problem. Okay, here we go. Is everyone still seeing my screen? Is my screen changing? Yeah, we see your screen. It's just not in yeah. presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. Try this. Sorry about that. Are we in presentation mode now? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. It's the same slide though, the impact of yep. miniaturization. I'm trying to get into, trying to, here we go, perfect. So the next thing that we would look at would be um, motional inductance. And, and motional, and here we see motional inductance relative to package size. And um, we can see that the motional inductance does go up as package size goes down. And basically what that means is as we go down in package size, it takes longer for us to start. Here we can look at our 26 megahertz crystal in the seven by five millimeter package size and our oscillator will have about a two millimeter, uh, two millisecond startup time. But if we take that 26 megahertz crystal and stick it in our 1.6 by 1.2 millimeter package, the start time goes up to about three milliseconds. You know, this is important for us if we're, um, if we're looking to time events or looking to sequence events or if our uh, microprocessor needs to see a signal um, before it starts doing something for us. So we just need to keep in mind the smaller size means a smaller electrode. The smaller electrode means a large L1. And uh, size, start time increases as size goes down. On some of these sides, you'll see I have the actual equations that you can use to help calculate your values. Um, we can see L1 is on the in the numerator here, so we can see that as uh, the package goes bigger, that L1 will get bigger, and our start time will will start to increase as well. So. Miniaturization uh, size reduction to me is about balancing the trade-offs. We all want to take advantage of this, you know, the advantages of size uh, reduction, reduced board space, um, higher frequencies, maybe better stabilities because of reduced circuit effects. But we want to avoid the disadvantages of reduced size, uh, namely higher um, ESRs, um, longer start times or perhaps a decreased poolability as a result of circuit effects. And so looking forward, we'll talk about what we can do to mitigate those. This is basically, or this is a basic microprocessor or DSP type of oscillator design. We have our X1 and X2 inputs. Um, the um, uh, IC manufacturer controls predominantly most of the oscillator circuit based on the amplifiers that they have inside. They do give us a few knobs every now and again that we can adjust. Um, you know, the load capacitors here, we see a, a CL1 and CL2. These would be the load capacitors on the crystal. These are generally recommended by the manufacturer. And then they might give us a, a drive limiting resistor or a feedback resistor that we can use. But overall, there's really not a lot of knobs that we can, you know, that we have that we can use to make adjustments. But we'll find out the good news is CL affects a lot of that. So we can use our load capacity to offset the effects of a higher ESR to give us more negative gain. Negative resistance is the measure of the oscillator and its ability to get a crystal oscillating. Um, most, as we lower load capacity, we can see that the negative gain starts to increase. The more negative gain we have, the more reliable our oscillator will be. Normally, we like this negative gain to be at five to 10 times higher than the crystal ESR and to assure reliable operation. So we may adjust these values of C1 or C, uh, CL1, CL2 to give us a lower value to get us more gain 
if we're using a smaller crystal package where we have a high ESR. The same way we might use load capacity to um, lower the drive level of the crystal. Because we have a relatively small crystal um, and because there's more modes in the crystal or more vibrational modes in the crystal than just we, the one we want, if we activate the crystal with a lot of energy, the chances are we might get one of these unwanted modes to, to start up or the crystal may not start oscillating at the right frequency. Um, that would be due again to one of these spurious modes or uh, uh, perhaps a perturbation in the crystal. Uh, again, a mode that we activated as a result of the amount of energy that we put into the crystal. So again, we might adjust these load capacities. As we lower the load capacity, we uh, lower the drive level. Ideally, we'll keep the load capacity or excuse me, the drive level somewhere in the 50 microwatt region. Um, certainly less than 100 microwatts is where we want to be from a drive level standpoint. And then finally, we want, you know, we've made some changes to CL. Um, we might have adjusted the load capacity to get a better negative gain. We might have adjusted the load capacity to get a better drive level. And in that regard, you know, one of the things we might want to do is make sure that our crystal is running on frequency. I kind of alluded to it in some of the earlier slides, but as we change the load capacity of the crystal, we also change the frequency of the crystal. And it's actually a good tool for us because as load capacity goes up, frequency goes down. And as load capacity goes down, frequency goes up. So if you're measuring the frequency of your crystal and you're seeing it lower than the frequency you wanted, that means the load in your circuit is higher than the load the crystal was manufactured for. And so, you know, you could adjust that simply by lowering your load capacity to bring the crystal back to center frequency. But so changes to the load capacity do affect the frequency tolerance and tuning. And that's something that you're going to want to check as you go through your circuit measurements to make sure you've got a reliable configuration. All that, you know, and what we're really talking about there is oscillator matching. Oscillator matching is what we do to make sure the circuit can deal with the crystal. We're gonna test and measure key circuit parameters of the crystal, namely frequency tolerance, drive level, and the negative gain of the circuit. With those three values, we can verify that the crystal and oscillator circuit are matched, that the frequency of the crystal is centered, that your drive level is an appropriate area and you've got all the conditions that are re required for reliable oscillation and reliable startup over the life of the product. We'll go into how we do some of that oscillator matching. It's pretty straightforward testing. It's your basic bench equipment, an oscilloscope, a network analyzer, some multimeters, a couple of power supplies, and you can do this too in your lab. You know, for the frequency measurement, we're gonna take an active probe or a, a low capacitance probe because we don't want the probe to be affecting the frequency of the crystal. And we're simply gonna stick it in the crystal and we're gonna measure the frequency of the, of the, uh, the, the, that the crystal is oscillating at. From that frequency, we can tell what the load capacity is on the PC board. And then we can adjust that load capacity as required to get the crystal to oscillate at the appropriate frequency. Here we kind of see how we would do that. This would be in the yellow box would be the crystal equivalent circuit. The green box would be what we have out on our, out on our board, which is the negative gain and the load capacity. And here we can see, you know, the various parameters of the equivalent circuit of the crystal. And there's two ways again, that we can fix the problem of frequency matching. One is we can adjust the CL on the board to match the crystal so that the crystal is oscillating on frequency or we can adjust the load capacity the crystal is manufactured to so it matches the load capacity on the board. The way we go with this is going to be dependent on the other parameters that we measure, the drive level and the negative R and any changes that we might need to see there. Drive level measurement is, you know, uh, is really a, you know, an I squared R type of equation. We're going to measure the um, uh, uh, the voltage coming out of the, the the oscillator. We're going to measure the current with a current probe going through the oscillator, and then we're able to calculate the amount of um, resistance that's um, 
available there. What we'll do, uh, or excuse me, the drive level that we have there. And again, depending on the drive level that we have, we may adjust the load capacity up or down relative to that in order to get the drive level to an appropriate level, something under 100 microwatts. The reason why drive level is important, and I had mentioned this earlier, is the fact that crystals have more than one mechanical mode in them. The AT cut crystal has the AT mode of vibration, and if we make our crystals correctly, that's the mode that we're going to get it to oscillate on. But there are other modes, and, uh, and the crystal could oscillate on unwanted frequencies. Higher drive levels increase the chances that we're going to couple into one of those unwanted modes. It increases the chances that the crystal is going to be um, are going to start off frequency or run off frequency. These changes can be hard to track down because they could be temperature driven so that you might not see them at room temperature. You would only see them at 62 degrees or 63 degrees. Um, and they would only occur for a short period of time relative to, you know, the amount of energy that's going into the crystal and the excitement of that unwanted mode. So mode hopping or moding in the crystal can be difficult to track down. Again, a reason why we want to keep that drive level low for smaller packages. Typical drive level, you know, like I said, it, you know, is up to about 200 microwatts. The smaller the package, the lower the drive level. Typically, we want that drive level under 100 microwatts. In about the, you know, 10 microwatt area is a good place to be. Talk about the spurious response that you showed. Sure. So, um, Whenever we talk about a spurious response, it's a non-harmonically related mode to the crystal. It's, an, it's, a, it's a mode of oscillation in the quartz crystal as a result of the lattice structure in the quartz crystal. And um, the, uh, uh, as we apply energy to the crystal, ideally we're gonna get the mode that we want to start up, but depending upon the temperature that we might be at, or depending upon the circuit conditions that we might have, um, we can get the crystal to start in one of these non-harmonically related, related modes. And this would be an example of that type of spurious response where we're tracking along over temperature. And this would be the typical temperature response of an AT cut quartz crystal. And at a particular temperature, because of the amount of energy that we're applying to the crystal or because of the, the design of the oscillator circuit, the crystal is able to jump to one of these non-harmonically related modes in the crystal and actually oscillate all off frequency. Um, it could take your 26 megahertz crystal and make it go to 30 megahertz or make it go to 32 megahertz. It's really, uh, you know, the actual frequency it's good jumping to is not going to be important. Just the fact that it's going to be jumping off frequency is going to be a big enough problem for our circuit as it is. So you have to compensate so, for that. Yes. And we do that by um, the way we design the crystal, the way we design the electrodes on the crystal, and again, by the energy level that we put into the crystal. So we have a question here that came up. Mm -hmm. Will that allow switching of the clock signal generator? Is everything done separately for each access sensing? So I think that has to go back to how you were probing it, I believe. Yeah, so each, each setup will be, a, you know, will be slightly different. Um, you know, in terms of the way you measure the frequency of the crystal relative to the way you measure the drive level with the frequency measurement, we're going to use a, you know, a regular uh, uh, um, a high impedance scope probe. With the current measurement, we're going to be using a, a, a current probe for our, our analyzer or our, our uh, oscilloscope. And uh, for the negative R, um, we're really going to be watching uh, again using a, a, a current probe and as well as a variable resistor. So there are different setups that we have for the to measure the different parameters. Separate probes. Mm -hmm. So whenever we're measuring negative R, negative gain of the circuit, and, and the negative gain is the ability for the circuit to start the crystal into oscillation. And ideally, it, well, it has to be higher than the resistance of the crystal, otherwise it wouldn't be able to kick the crystal into gear and get the crystal moving. Ideally, we want that negative R to be higher than uh, five to 10 times higher than the resistance of the crystal. So we have enough oomph from the circuit to get the crystal started. The way we measure that is with our current probe. 
and with our uh, variable resistor. And we'll simply, we will literally put a variable resistor between the crystal and the, and the PC board. We'll change the value of that variable resistor. We'll raise the value of that variable resistor until we see oscillation stop. Whenever we see oscillation stop, that gives us the negative gain or the negative R of the circuit. And then we'll turn it back down until we see oscillation start again. And that's how we determine the negative R that's available to us in the circuit. So the negative R would be the load of the crystal plus the load of the variable resistor. And, um, and again, five to 10 times the maximum ESR value of your crystal is what we're looking for in terms of negative gain. So the way we might do that is um, by, again, adjusting our uh, load capacity. Um, reducing load capacity helps increase the amount of negative gain we have. And here we see the equation for negative R or gain um, with the transconductance of the IC on the top, but the load capacitors on the bottom. And so as we lower these load capacities, the negative R will tend to go up. In the same time, you know, we certainly want to make sure that we're looking at uh, start time. We want to make sure that the, um, the, the negative gain is uh, sufficient to get the oscillator started relative to um, the inductance that we have. And so we do want to measure uh, or make sure that we optimize the negative R, the better the negative R, the faster the start time. And we can see that the negative R here is on the bottom of the equation. So as that goes up, start time goes down. So just to wrap things up, uh, you know, we've kind of been through a lot uh, in terms of the crystals. We've looked at the crystal size. We've looked at how the equivalent circuit changes. We've looked at how we can adjust the uh, circuit parameters to accommodate the changes in our crystal. And so I figured I would just kind of wrap up with the recommended oscillation conditions that we really look for. You know, ideally your load capacity will be somewhere between eight to 12 picofarads. The lower, the better. The closer to eight you can be, the better. Ideally, your drive level range will be between 0.01 microwatts and 200 microwatts. We want it less than 100 microwatts. Closer, the closer you can get to 0.01, the better. And again, the negative gain needs to be at least five times higher than the resistance of your crystal. Um, and we like it to be a little bit lower than, than 10 times. And, you know, this is the ESR of your crystal. So the, you know, we're talking about five times the maximum ESR of your crystal. So if the ESR of your crystal is 50 ohms, you should have at least 250 ohms worth of negative gain available to ensure reliable startup. And so size affects the crystal performance. All the changes are manageable. We use oscillator matching to make sure we understand how the size is impacting the performance of the crystal. And hopefully you saw that not all 26 megahertz crystals are the same. So um, with that, you know, I'll throw it out to the field uh, for any questions. Hey, Corey, this is Bob Ball. Can you hear me? I can, Bob. Okay. Maybe you can address the audience uh, about if they, if, if they saw something they like here, they want to try something about our, you know, our sample policy and how they can go about getting a sample? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, of course, uh, we are um, at all the distributors. And so you'll find, uh, you know, our crystal stock, et cetera, in the, you know, in a, on our distributor shelf. Um, you can certainly contact any one of our sales representatives at the Aurora Group. You can contact myself or contact uh, Jordan with your sample request. Um, and uh, um, we certainly want to work with you in terms of your oscillator design. So, you know, give us a, um, we can help you with oscillator matching. We can, you know, come to your site and help you do the oscillator matching there. You can send us a board and we can do the oscillator matching at our site and, you know, verify that you got a reliable crystal operation. So for samples, simply call a partner or Bob or any of our Aurora sales representatives. Um, for oscillator matching, uh, feel free to get a hold of them as well. We're just going to need a board in order to test. Thank you. Did I answer that, Bob? Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's another question that came in again. Um, let's see. So the result 
is, see, oh, it's bouncing around on me now. Ah, the result of the linear amplified and compensated voltage signal with defined conversion constant. Okay, so there's, don't really understand the question in there, but I, I did forward it to you as well, Corey. Okay, I'm see okay. if I can do that. Where's the chat window? Yeah, it has to do with the, the linear amplified and compensated voltage signal with a divine with a defined conversion constant. So I'm not sure. But he's uh the fellow's gonna email the full design. Yeah, I'd have him get uh, that uh, I'd have him give us a, an email uh, or yeah. a call. I'm, I'm asking for that. a deeper email on that. Mm -hmm. um, what are the crystal considerations for long term aging and stability? It's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it kind of goes back to what we were we were talking about that the crystal's frequency is is kind of thickness driven and 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 you know whenever we talk about the stability, there's three things that we that we get concerned about whenever we talk about the accuracy of the crystal: calibration, temperature stability, and aging or time tolerance. Calibration tolerance is the tolerance at 25 degrees C. That's kind of a manufacturing tolerance. Um, how much time do we put into the crystal in order to get it to your particular frequency? This temperature stability is driven by the way we cut the quartz. Um, if I cut the bar of quartz at this angle, I get one temperature stability. If I rotate the bar of quartz at a different angle, I get a different temperature stability. And then, um, so that's controlled by the way we cut the quartz or cut the wafer from the bar quartz. The aging on the other hand is kind of the separator between good manufacturers and bad manufacturers in my book. Uh, um, a good manufacturer will have a good aging rate, a poor manufacturer will have a large aging rate. And the reason why is because of the, the stabilization inside the package. You know, um, if we add mass to the crystal, it will increase in free, it will decrease in frequency. If we take mass off the crystal, it will increase in frequency. So when I have that crystal sealed up in that package, if I I have contaminants inside my package that will adhere to my quartz crystal, then that's going to affect my quartz crystal frequency. If I have contaminants on my quartz crystal that come off my quartz crystal, then that's going to affect my quartz crystal um, as well, just in a different direction. So, you know, the aging effect is really related to the manufacturing of the crystal and how well the manufacturer, you know, um, how cleanly the manufacturing process was and how well the manufacturer controlled the process to eliminate stresses in the crystal. So aging is due to contaminants and stress relaxation and a good manufacturer will accommodate or have a process that accommodates both of those that will have a low stress manufacturing process and we'll have a very clean manufacturing process so that we get a reduced aging rate. Aging is not linear. So if you look at uh, you know, uh, a crystal's aging rate, it, a typical crystal might age two to three parts per million in their first year. And then after that, because the stress relaxation and the contaminant migration has already occurred, the aging rate will slow down. So perhaps in the next year or the second year, the aging rate will only be one uh, half a part per million to one part per million. Um, so the aging does slow down over a period of time as the effects that cause aging diminish. Did I answer the question? I think you did. Can you so, scroll down to your uh, contact information, Corey? And also, this presentation will be sent out to everybody, correct, Caroline? That is correct, Caporna. Yeah, thanks for sending that over, Corey. So when I post the um, video recording to Meetup, I will also include Corey's slides. Thanks for checking, Caporna. Yeah, folks on the call, Corey's quite knowledgeable. So throw out your questions. Yeah. Between Corey and, and Jordan, we'll try to do our best uh, to answer those questions uh, right now, or you can certainly send it to us in the chat window and we could uh, reiterate it on, on this call. Yeah, it, we can certainly, uh, you know, we look forward to a chance to talk to any of you about your design or about uh, uh, your situations that you have with crystals. Um, we like to talk about quartz and, and we do it with frequency. So um, let us know. Uh, are there any uh, challenging applications you want to talk about? Uh, we got just we got about fifteen minutes, so we're, well, we're good on time, right, Caroline? 
Yeah, we have plenty of time. So if, if you do think of a question as a part of said, feel free to unmute yourself, ask a question that way if you're comfortable or place those in the chat box. We'd be happy to answer those for you. Yeah, and and I think you know we've we've really kind of addressed I think the the challenge that we're all up against you know from a crystal manufacturing standpoint we all want to get um, our frequencies we all want to get our products as small as we can and you know we're continuing to drive the the package sizes down we actually have a 1.0 by 0.8 millimeter crystal in development that will be you know, introducing at some point in time. You know, the problem is in that small package, the quartz almost gets to be like a marble to some degree. You got a very thick piece of quartz in a, with a small length and width dimension in a, you know, a very small package. And so, you know, while we can make the crystal in a 1.0 by 0.8 millimeter package right now, the ESR of the crystal is 200 ohms, which is probably not usable in a lot of applications. So our challenge is improving the surface finish of the crystal and improving our manufacturing techniques so we can bring the resistance of that, that crystal down, um, you know, type of thing. So I think size reduction is the challenge that we're all facing um, in terms of getting our crystals to oscillate in, in, in smaller packages and offsetting our circuits to allow that to happen or switching over to oscillators because, uh, you know, I know with depending on the protocol you're looking at, for example, Bluetooth, Zigbee, uh, those types of things, the, the, um, the, the stabilities aren't that critical um, for the crystals, but, you know, depending on the, you know, the telemetry that you are using, you may need a, a better accuracy than that. So we do actually have, you know, TCXOs that can provide, you know, a plus or minus one part per million stability in a 2.0 by 1.6 millimeter package. So if you need a small size with a tight stability, you know, we have that capability with our TCXOs as well. We also have uh, uh, clock oscillators uh, that are improving in stability as well. We're now able to go up to 105 and uh, 125 degrees centigrade temperature ranges, and we're able to maintain the stability of the oscillators to, you know, Bluetooth type of applications. And so in that regard, uh, um, you know, we're constantly pushing our frequencies or excuse me, our products smaller. Um, we're looking to improve the accuracy of those products and we're trying to reduce the power consumption of those guys. You know, you I mentioned a that little the, bit about that. Sorry, Corey, do you want to talk a little bit about the applications that these are going into now? Just well, um, you know, really everything needs a crystal or an oscillator. That's the, you know, the, really the nice thing. So, um, uh, you know, even if you use an IC. Even if they use an IC, um, you know, the, the issue becomes the accuracy that they need out of it. So, so if, if you need a, a, all crystals have a temperature, all crystals have a calibration tolerance, all crystals have a temperature stability, and all crystals have an aging rate. And if you don't have a way to mitigate those in your circuit or compensate for those in your circuit, the stability of your circuit is really driven by the stability of the crystal, right? As accurate as the crystal is, is that's how accurate your, your circuit will be. When you look at an oscillator, we can, you know, we're now able to take that crystal, put it in an oscillator circuit so we can calibrate the crystal while it's in our circuit. So we can tighten up that calibration tolerance. Um, we can, you know, make sure that the crystals, you know, packaged appropriately so that we, you know, diminish the, you know, the aging effects of that. And, and so we're able to achieve um, tighter stabilities in smaller packages than our customers might be able to achieve elsewhere. Applications that we see these used in are, you know, communi you know it's really communications, uh, um, automotive, um, uh, consumer. Uh, uh, you know, I really just can't think of an application today that isn't taking advantage of some wireless technology or some wireless protocol. And, and anytime you say wireless, you got to talk crystal control in order to make sure that you're receiving what you're sending. There's a new, uh, there's a long question here. If you can look in the chat box really quick, uh, Corey. So we'll see in the chat box. So this, uh, this gentleman has an application that isn't size constraint, but okay. does need PPB accuracy and stability. Okay. Well, whenever you say PPB accuracy and stability, you know, that to me says, you know, you're, you're going to be looking at an oscillator or some sort of compensation, right? Yes, uh, so we all know that, 
Yeah. We all know that crystals have errors, and there's uh, ways that we can compensate for that error. One is a temperature compensated crystal oscillator where we actually change the load capacity of the crystal to offset the frequency movement as a function of temperature so that we get a stable performance over temperature. The next thing that we talk about is oven control or temperature control rather than temperature compensation where we actually hold the crystal at a very precise temperature. And by holding the crystal at a precise temperature, we're we're able to eliminate any other sources of error. And that's where we achieve that PPB act, PPB or parts per billion type of accuracy. We've been talking about parts per million all along here. Parts per billion are about is a thousand times, you know, tighter than that. And that's our ovenized oscillators. And, and we certainly produce ovenized oscillators um, ranging, you know, all the way down to nine by seven millimeters in size. So we've got some pretty small OCXOs and can give you part per billion stability in some pretty small packages. But in order to achieve part per billion stability, you need to do additional uh, compensation. You need to do additional correction on the crystal. So the follow-up question was, uh, how stable can I get an oven stabilized crystal oscillator? How stable it, uh, it, you know, it, that's going to be relative to size again. Um, so we actually have oscillators that are, that would do sub part per billion, almost atomic standard type of accuracies, um, you know, sub part per billion per day type of things. Um, and then we have ovenized oscillators that are very small that would do, you know, maybe 10 part per billion. So um, the accuracy is going to be related to the conditions. As long as we're talking about a constant temperature, um, you know, then, you know, the, uh, the accuracy is, is, is very good. There's really nothing that's going to be changing. No matter um, the size, right? So the accuracy, as long as the temperature is stable, doesn't matter whether it's a big crystal or a small correct. crystal, it's pretty stable. Correct. The temperature and now you got to do some things to fix that. Correct. Good yeah, question. Yeah. It's all about controlling those three sources of error, calibration, time, and temperature. Um, the calibration we control with the load capacity. We stick the crystal in our circuit and it's going to run at a particular frequency. And if we adjust the load capacity up or down, we can get that crystal to run closer to our desired frequency. Um, so we can adjust out the um, calibration tolerance with our load. The um, temperature tolerance is something that we either need to, is, is going to be there. We either need to live with it we either need to compensate for it or we need to eliminate it. And, and those are the things that we do in our clock oscillators. We tend to live with it. The accuracy of the clock oscillator is driven by the accuracy of the crystal. The more accurate the crystal, the better the clock oscillator is. In our temperature compensated oscillators, we actually add a, a network that senses the temperature of the, the air outside and changes the um, conditions of the circuit inside or the load capacity of the circuit inside to offset any changes as a function of temperature. And then, like I said, our oven control oscillators actually control the temperature of the oscillator um, to milli-degrees, you know, uh, over, a, over a temperature range. So um, we're able to eliminate the temperature error by eliminating any temperature change. So Corey, there's another question that came in that says, uh, does Taichan address the one-off communications device market like two-way radio transmitters, for example? Sure. Well, that's the platonic side of the business, right? Um, you know, the uh, you know. So while Tai Chian and platonics can both satisfy those types of requirements, uh, platonics because of uh, their position and and manufacturing capabilities are in a better position to support those one-off type of things. So certainly, give us a call with those. Um, yes, the way I started in this business was supporting uh, ham radio guys. Uh, so I'd love to recrystallize you if you're, you're ham radio. Give us a call. I don't see any more questions coming in. Is there anything we're missing? Anybody else uh, on the team or on the call, Jordan or Maureen? Jordan, you have anything you want to add? Uh, add anything. Jordan? I think you covered it very well, Corey. I appreciate the... Um, time you took to kind of go through all the different parameters of the crystal and and put it in a format that everybody can understand. So I thought that was really good. Um, I guess just from my standpoint, being in sales, um, as Corey mentioned, uh, as far as samples go, feel free to reach out to us directly or 
Um, we have, you know, uh, stock on the shelf at all your major distributors with Glatronics. Um, you can find their components at, you know, the Aero Abnets of the world. Uh, uh, Digikey is, is the primary um, distributor for Titan. And we've got over 1,200 different parts on the shelf at Digikey. Um, so, uh, yeah, either way, just feel free to reach out to us. We're very happy to help in any way we can. Yeah, we're very distribution friendly in that regard. Uh, both Platronics and Tai Chan are, are represented on DigiKey. Um, as uh, Jordan indicated, 1,200 part numbers on DigiKey for Tai Chan. So that's just a, uh, you know, a great place to go for parts. Well, I think that just leaves us just a few minutes uh, to close. Uh, if nobody has any additional questions, uh, we just turn it back over to uh, Caroline. Caroline. Great presentation, Corey. Thanks for um, facilitating the chat box of Parna and um, for weighing in, Jordan. Um, again, I encourage you to please reach out to Corey and Aparna and Jordan with any of your questions. And again, this presentation, um, the slide deck that Corey was um, so nice to share, as well as the recording, will be available on the meetup page that you registered. Um, so again, we'll leave it open for just one more minute in case any last minute questions come in. But thank you so much for joining. Um, Corey, Aparna, yeah. Jordan, thank you for being here. Uh, great presentation, very informative. Thank you. Uh, we hope the team, everybody got something out of it. We'll look forward to working with uh, uh, the, the members as we move forward. It's good that we get to conclude on time as well. So there you go. Thanks a lot. Yeah, great timing. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I tend to go fast. so. Uh, Time is generally not a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Corey. Thank you. Good job. Okay, Thanks, Bob. Everybody. Thanks. Thank yep. you. Thank you, everybody. Take okay. care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care.